A vision unfolds, a new kingdom, a new earth. Imagine a world where humanity is fully restored, where every tear is wiped away and death is no more. In this revelation, the promise of Jesus' return brings hope and renewal. Behold, the dawn of a new era where all things are made new. Prepare your hearts and minds for the King is coming. A triumphant return ushering in eternal glory and unending peace. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. My name is Pierce Drake. I'm one of the pastors here. It is an honor to be back with you this morning. Um, and as I've said the last few months, I don't know how the scheduling has happened, but for whatever reason, I keep getting Communion Sunday, and uh, I'll have it in November too. And uh, I love coming to the table. Um, receiving the grace and love of Jesus as we open up his word. And let me go ahead and say this on the front end. I don't know if I have ever prepared and got ready to preach a sermon where I sense that I have the potential to receive more upset emails at me than this one. So we came to the table for multiple reasons first. That you would have a little grace on the topic but that you also, before you send an email, you're more than welcome to send them. You're more than welcome to send an email, but here's my encouragement. You have to go back and watch it again because there's so much that we're about to cover. There's so much that we're gonna dive into that if you get fixated on a point, you may miss the main point and miss the heart of what I'm trying to say. I mean, today we are gonna cover these things. We're gonna cover the dragon. We're gonna cover the beast from the sea. We're gonna cover the beast of the earth. We're gonna cover political ideologies and government. We're gonna cover religious uh, deviances and we're gonna end with the mark of the beast. You ready? Don't leave now. <laughs> but here's where, I wanna know, here's where I wanna start off with before we even jump into the text. Is the remembering of this that revelation is not a crystal ball of the future, but revelation is about discipleship to Jesus. Revelation is not a crystal ball of the future, but it is about discipleship to Jesus. So with that heart and with that understanding, let us go to God in prayer. Jesus, we love you. Your word is authoritative in our life and given all things ready for salvation. So as we took of the, of the bread and of the cup this morning, be with us now as we receive your words. In your name we pray, amen. So before we even jump into 13, we need to just remember how 12 ended. Because the last verse in chapter 12 is the thing that sets all of this in motion, all of this coming forth. And here's what we ended with last week in chapter 12. It said this, then the dragon, who is Satan, when the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to wage war against the rest of her offspring, those who keep God's commands and hold fast to their testimony about Jesus. We end 12 stepping into 13 with the dragon as mad as he has ever been with one goal is to, is to take out the woman, to take out the son, to take out the child, and to take out anyone who falls under the teaching of the child, God's holy people. That is the cliffhanger in which we walk into chapter 13. We have to know this at the core. The dragon hates Jesus. And the dragon hates God's people who love Jesus. So what we're gonna look at as we look at these two beasts in front of us and the mark of the beast, we're gonna look at what is the picture, what is the posture in which they are trying to convince the world of and then as we realize what they're trying to convince the world of and we get the picture, then we're gonna take a microscope and we're gonna look at what are the splinters or the cracks in the picture that does not make it whole. And then from that position, where do we find perfection? So let's begin with the beast of the sea. As Lauren started out our scripture this morning, let me read those first four chapters along with a few more. Hear it again. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. 
It had 10 horns and seven heads and 10 crowns on its horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his authority and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed and the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshiped the dragon on, because he had given authority to the beast and they also worshiped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? Verse five, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander the name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and tongue. And all nations and inhabitants of the earth will, will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life and the Lamb who was slain before the creation of the world. Here's John's repeatable phrase all throughout Revelation. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The beast of the sea, the beast of the sea's role is primarily a political one. Listen to the political undertones in, in those 10 verses. The beast has 10 crowns. The, the dragon gave the beast power and his throne and great authority. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed like a leader, the beast. Verse four, he's given authority again. He's worshiped as an incredible leader. Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against the beast? All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. And power was given to the beast to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. This is an authoritative language. This is a political leader. Now before you start jumping, here's what we need to know, is that all throughout Revelation, we see pictures that give imagery to the character and nature of both who God is, who the Son is, who the Holy Spirit is, and who the dragon is and the beast will be. It's all imagery, it's not a crystal ball of the future. So as I read this, do not picture a certain person in your mind. If you find yourselves watching Fox News as your major place, do not picture the Democratic Party. If you watch CNN and ABC and CBS, the other ones, do not picture Donald Trump as the person here. It is imagery of a political leader standing on behalf of the dragon to wage war against God's people. That is the picture. And the false picture is that you can trust this leader. You can follow this leader. This leader will produce goodness and protection and provision in your life. But look at the splinters within the text. It starts off in the very beginning of chapter 13. It's quaint, it's small, but it points back to Daniel as so often John does. In verse two, he said this, the beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had the feet of a bear in the mouth of a lion. I don't have time to jump into all of it, but in Daniel chapter seven, he gets a picture, a vision in a dream of four nations who have run against and, and gone against who God is. And they are described in Daniel chapter seven as a lion and a leopard, as a bear and a lamb. And so, the four creatures that we see in Daniel chapter seven as political entities and kingdoms of this world running against God and the only true living God is now John saying they have become one. Splinter number one. Splinter number two of the beast of the sea is found in this moment. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God. And all who did not were put to death. Luke 6, 45, Jesus tells you that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
So the political leader can look like whatever you want your political leader to look like. They can be strong and and they they can lead and they can wage war and they can win war and they can look like they provide for you and provision for you and protect you and all of the things you want out of your political leader. It can look like all of those things, but when the beast opens its mouth, it opens its mouth to blaspheme God and to take out God's people and reveals the heart of the beast. So listen carefully. Listen carefully to what the beast may have to say. The truth is this. When government seeks to become God, it does not become divine, it becomes demonic. For any political party, for any political nation, for any political person, any moment the government seeks to become God, it does not become divine, it becomes demonic demonic. This is what Daryl Johnson wrote. The beast from the sea is a dragon manipulated political power used by the dragon to pressure disciples of Jesus, the one true emperor, to compromise their loyalty to him. John is telling his fellow disciples that the state has become the servant of Satan. So the first beast is the beast of the sea and the political pressure. So let's continue on. The beast of the earth. Starting in verse 11. John says, then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth and it had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs causing fire to come down from heaven and to to the earth and in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. And it ordered them to set up an image to honor the beast who was wounded by the sword yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. If the first beast's purpose is that of political role and power, the second beast, the beast of the earth's role, is primarily a religious one. It's a religious beast. It's a false prophet. Listen to the language that sounds like what you would read out of the Old Testament or moments in Acts where where God moves in power in his people. And he made the earth and his habits worship the first beast. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven and to earth and to, in full view of the people. This sounds like Elijah on Mount Carmel, where he stands in a political scene against all of the, 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 the prophets of Baal in this moment to say, who is the one true God? You have hundreds of people standing against God. And what does Elijah do? He sets up an offering and they cannot bring fire to the offering. They cut themselves. They do all of these things. And yet nothing happens to the altar. Their God, who is not a real living God, who is just an a, a imagination judge, they then stop. They can't perform the sign. And what does Elijah do in that moment? Elijah goes, in the middle of a drought, he goes, bring buckets of water, just buckets of water, just buckets of water to pour over the offering, to soak it, to waterlog it. And then what does he do? He calls down fire from heaven in the name of the one true living God, and it falls down like lightning. And it falls down and it takes up everything and soaks up all the water. So you can't tell me that when the people in this position in in Revelation chapter three, knows the story, knows what it's like to have Elijah as one of their heroes, hears the beast of the earth, okay, and it performed great signs and caused fire to fall down from heaven. They're going, well, this this guy's on our team. He's with us. This is, he's causing people to worship. How beautiful. This is incredible. Great sign after great sign after great sign. But again, listen for the splinters in the mouth and the words of the beast of the earth. It was given power to breathe on the image of the first beast so that the image could speak 
and calls all who refuse to worship the image or refuse to worship the image to be killed. So again, the action can look like that of a prophet of God. But listen for the words that come out of the beast's mouth and you will see the true intention of the heart of the beast and the heart of the dragon and the heart of the first beast is to take out Jesus and his holy people. That is the singular purpose here. So when the government seeks to become God, it doesn't become divine, it becomes demonic. And when the church seeks to lead you anywhere besides the living God, it has become an enemy of the living God. Hear me there. When the church, this is where you keep us accountable. When the church seeks to lead you anywhere besides to the living God, it has become an enemy to the living God. Kenneth Collins says this, in this moment, neutrality is not an option. You must declare loyalties. Will you join all of creation in worshiping God and the Lamb? Revelation 5, 13 and 14. Or will you fall in with the whole earth in its worship of Satan and the beast? The picture that the dragon and the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea desire to project to you is the very picture and desire that Satan desired at the very beginning to be God. So the dragon is doing things like God. The uh, beast of the sea is doing things like God. The beast of the earth is doing things like God. In fact, commentaries will tell you that the three of them become a counterfeit trinity to our holy trinity. The dragon, you can put this up, is a counterfeit to the father. The beast of the sea is a counterfeit to the son. And the beast of the sea is a counterfeit to the Holy Spirit. What is the thing that they continually asked Jesus when he was here? When are you going to usher in your kingdom? When are you going to rule in power? When are you going to set up your throne here? Well, the beast of the sea is doing those very things. What is the Holy Spirit's primary job? It is to point us to Jesus, to get us to worship Jesus, to make us more like Jesus. What is the beast of the earth doing? He is pointing everyone to the first beast. Look at, the, look at this next slide. You can go ahead and put it up here really quick. The dragon, you can take pictures of it, is Revelation 12, is mimicking God the Father in Revelation 4. The beast of the sea, which we read 13, 1 through 10, is mimicking God the Son in Revelation 5. And the beast of the sea, which we just read 11 through 18, is mimicking and counterfeit of God the Holy Spirit as we find in Revelation 11. Robert Wall says this, the beast is present whenever and wherever human institutions or individual oppose the rule of the lamb and demand the worship of God alone deserves. No less that John's first readers, we are called to recognize the resist deceptions of the beast we are called to recognize and resist the deceptions of the beast. This takes time. This takes us to be slow to speak, to listen carefully. Remember, this is less about an actual person showing up as it is the character and nature of the beast. From the sea, the dragon, or the beast of the earth. So let's get to the point where you all send emails and let's talk about the mark of the beast. <laughs> Revelation, picking up in verse 16. So the beast of the sea, or sorry, the beast of the earth, forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for its number is of man, the number is 666. There's so many different thoughts of what 666 means. 
And throughout time, there have been many people say it represents this person or this time. In the early days of John's writing this, um, it was believed that, that Nero had been killed but, but then had escaped and, and maybe he wasn't killed and the rumor went around the Roman Empire that, that he really wasn't dead and he actually was gonna come back to reign. And if you take Nero's name and you put it through Greek and then you put it through Hebrew and then you spell out the numbers associated with the letters, you get 666. And so it's like, is it Nero? There's, there's thoughts as, you know, if you, if you did an upside down cartwheel and you ate ice cream too fast and then you spun around on your head a little bit, it could be the person you wanted it to be. There was thoughts that if you took Ronald Reagan's name and added his middle name in there, somehow it added up to 666. And here's the thing, there's a lot of thoughts. Here's the thing that I want you to hear more than anything when it comes to the mark of the beast. That 666 is not about the identity of the beast as much as it is the character of the beast. It's about the character of the beast. So then we shift perspective, then we shift questions and it's no longer about, hey, is that the beast? Is this the beast? Is the beast over here? Is the beast over there? Is the antichrist here? It's where is the character of the beast showing up? And 666 is a, among many things, John loves numbers and the meaning of numbers and all throughout scripture, seven is a number of completion and perfection. So 666 can be said as failure upon failure upon failure. Failure of the dragon not to be God the Father. Failure of the dragon of the earth not to be the Son. And failure of the dragon of the uh, earth not to be the Holy Spirit and of the sea of the Son. G.K. Beale wrote this. The forehead, I love this. I l absolutely love this. The forehead represents ideological commitment and the hand, the practical outworking of the commitment. So when the beast is, says, hey, I'm gonna mark your head, I'm gonna mark your hand, G.K. Bill says, we need to be looking at, okay, the beast is after our mind and after our hands. If he can convince us in our minds that he desires or is worthy to be worshiped, if he can be, can be honored, if we can lift him high, if we can follow after him, then our hands become actions of the beast in the world around us. And so we begin to live and have our being and, and work as if agents of the beast because our mind is convinced, but yet our hands are now doing the work of our mind. But there's been splinters all throughout this text. And this is the splinter. This is the splinter that just wrecked my heart when I saw it this week. While the beast comes to change your mind, to affect your hands, to pull you away from God, what's really missing? The heart. The heart's missing. Jesus desires your heart. Out of love, he came from a love of his heart for you. Nothing in the dragon Nothing in the beast of the sea, nothing in the beast of the earth has anything to do with your heart, has nothing to do with love. So it makes no surprise to me that when the, when the beast marks its people, it marks it on its head, its idolatries, and it marks its hands. It's living out those things that they now believe. The enemy has no place in your heart. The enemy doesn't have a right to your heart. It has been bought and paid for by the living God. He purchased your heart. He purchased your soul. He purchased who you are as a person. He begins here because he loves you, not in your mind where it's manipulative to get you to do just simply what he wants you to do. He starts and begins and ends with love. My friends, we are marked. We are marked, but we are wholly marked by a holy God with a holy love. Let me dip my toe. I'm not taking away from Sorensen's sermon next week, but let me dip my toe into 14 for half a second. 14 verse one says this, then I looked and there before me was the lamb standing on the Mount Zion, 
and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Oh, you are marked, friends. You are marked, brothers. You are marked, sisters. We don't carry the mark of the beast and the character of the beast. No, we carry the mark of a holy God with a holy love. That's what marks us. That's where we live our life out of. That from a place of understanding that we are loved, the beloved of God, that we then begin to understand his ways that are higher than our ways and then our hands become actions into the world and into the community that we honor the king and we build his kingdom. That is who we are. It says in, in throughout Revelation 13, there are three ways that you are marked with holy love. In verse, at the end of verse 10, John writes this, that it calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. And in verse 18, John writes this calls for wisdom. You, my brother, and you, my sister, are marked by patient endurance. We're gonna run the race. How do we remain disciples in times of pressure and oppression? Faithful endurance, patience. We do it by faithfulness, and we do it by wisdom. Now, here's a hard question. All of this focus, all this focus has been on the beast, on the dragon, the beast of the earth, and the beast of the sea, and what they do, and what they say, and where they're leading. We've been looking at the, the mark of the beast, the character and nature of the beast. And so our eyes, up until this point, have been gazed upon the beast. And it's good to know your enemy, to know what your enemy does and doesn't do. But let me ask the question that I asked my question the last few weeks if I've studied this and I've found places. Where has the character and nature of the dragon, of the beast of the sea, of the beast of the earth, found its way as a shadow into your heart. I've got a lot of friends. I lived in Georgia growing up and my first job as a pastor was in Columbus, Georgia. And one of my deep honors of being in Columbus, Georgia was that I got to work with um, some chaplains of the US Army at Fort Benning. And a brigade leader was um, somebody that was in our church and his kids were in our youth group. And so I was on Fort Benning all the time. And so I would have dinners with soldiers and meet with them when they came back and do a little counseling here and there. And one of the things that I thought about in this is, is as we stand as holy people marked by a holy God with holy love, as we push back the forces of evil, as we push back the dragon, as we push back the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea, and as we fight the good fight, sometimes we need to pause and check ourselves: have we been hit? Because the adrenaline can run so quickly and so fast and, and you're in the moment and you're, and you're fighting against the oppression that you forget that in the moment you've been hit. So this morning, can we not pause the fight, but can we, as we hold up a shield out of holy love, can we examine our own heart to go, Jesus, where have I put a political ideology above you? Where have I spent more time looking at a news anchor than the holy word of God? Where have I, where have I looked at tickling my ears of pastors and leaders and, and religious leaders that are pointing me to a candidate or to a party or to a system and they're not pointing me to you? And so that's the thing I'm sharing on Facebook because I found that one pastor, I found that one person that'll tell me how that party's wrong and this party's right and how we, we are gonna die if this person doesn't get elected or die if this person doesn't get elected and we've taken our gaze off of Jesus. Where have we been hit, brothers and sisters? Where have we tried to take this and make it a crystal ball of what's happening and forget that it's actually a call just a deeper discipleship to Jesus? I'll end with this, my last few minutes. Uh, I got to be with 
Mark and um, some of our team down at Costa Rica. Um, Mark had the honor and delight to, to be a delegate. Um, I went for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to support my mother-in-law, who is now one of our bishops. And, uh, and so I went to just love on her and be there when she preached and be there um, when they voted on her to become one of our bishops and then be there for the consecration service the last night. That was my purpose. But what we began to see, Swayze was there, Pastor Drew, Bishop, and Bristol House. What we began to see was that there was this thing happening that doesn't happen at general conferences or annual conferences where we would be in legislation conversations and talking about Episcopacy and talking about our Constitution and our mission statement. And we would take a break and someone would strum a guitar and someone would say a word and the whole place would be prostrate on the floor before a holy God. We stood in, in, in a moment on Tuesday night among the Church of Costa Rica, the Methodist Church of Costa Rica, and we stood there in Bristol House led worship, and at the end, we called for a time of prayer, and I stood up in the balcony with my friends and my brothers and my sisters, and I watched as holy love just outpoured into the people, and people began to fall under the power of the Holy Spirit here and there and here and there, and I don't know if you believe in that, but let me tell you, as your pastor, I deeply believe in that. I believe in miracles. I believe in signs and wonders. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe in speaking in tongues. But none of that matters if you're a mean person. None of that matters if you don't carry the fruit of who the Holy Spirit is. It doesn't matter unless it's pointing us to who Jesus is. And so Monday night, we gathered with Bristol House as they came down. And, and I don't know if you know this about Mark Swayze. I know you know him, you love him. Let me tell you, I wrote in our e-news this week that I wanna be like Mary. Mary who anoints Jesus' feet with oil or with perfume. She knew what the moment was. She knew where he was headed. The disciples had no clue. They're missing the mark. Swayze is like a Mary. Swayze has a gift of knowing what's happening five, six layers deep in the room, in a gathering. So anytime that I'm with him as a brother, I'm just going, Swayze, what are you sensing? What do you feel? What is God saying to you? And so we sat, Bristol House and Drew and a few other on our team, we sat around a dinner on Monday night in Costa Rica in downtown San Jose, and we shared stories, and I said, Swayze, what are you sensing? And I wish you could have been there. What I'm about to tell you won't do justice to his eloquentness of it. But he said this. He said, the people known as Methodists began to have a division about 150 years ago. Are we gonna be a people of power? Or are we gonna be a people of purity? Are we gonna go after holiness? Or are we gonna go after the Holy Spirit? Are we gonna subject ourselves to the moving of the Holy Spirit and how he moves? Are we gonna be orderly and disciplined and have methods for everything? And the Azusa, Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s is the breaking point of a lot of places in Methodism where one side of Methodism got the power and one side of Methodism got the purity. And he goes, Pierce, it is the divided flame of power and purity coming back together in this moment as the undivided flame. This is the time as the people known as Methodist to come and live out of power and purity. I think that's when he, John says, this is a time that calls for wisdom, brothers and sisters. What does it mean to live out wisdom, to walk in purity, and to walk in power together as the undivided flame? So will you stand with me? Where do you need purity? Where do you need power? 
They are no longer two things, but one thing as the flame of God and the Holy Spirit rests on his people. How do we overcome? How are we wise? How are we faithful? How are we patient in endurance? How do we stand up against the character and nature of the dragon and the beast of the earth and the beast of the sea? We walk, church, in power and purity to the name that is above all names, the king that is above all kings, Jesus. His name above everything. So James says in his gospel, he says, if you ask for wisdom, I will give it to you, God says. It's one of the only prayers in all of scripture outside of salvation. If you believe in your heart and confess that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. One of the only ones that says, if you ask, I will give it to you, I will give you this, is wisdom. James says, if you ask for wisdom, God is faithful to give you wisdom. And what does wisdom look like for us? It looks like walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and it looks like walking in the purity of the Holy Spirit, that we may be holy like him. So let me pray. Jesus, I just pray for my brothers and sisters that we would desire one name and one name alone, and his name is Jesus, the one true living God. That it'll know that, God, you came after our heart, the very thing the enemy can't touch and doesn't desire because he has no place in it. That is the very place you came, is our heart out of love, that we are not marked by a beast and the character and nature of a beast in our forehead or our hands, in our ideologies or in our actions, but we are marked by a holy God with a holy love. And so we ask now in the presence of Jesus here in this room and, and online, that Holy Spirit, we ask for wisdom Will you fill us with purity? Make us holy, we can't do it. Our good actions are nothing but rags. Consecrate us holy as you are holy. And consecrate us with the power of the Holy Spirit. That as Paul said, or as Peter says in Acts chapter two, that they were, that, that the people were attested that Jesus is the son of the living God by his, by his miracles and actions and signs of wonders. So we believe in those things, Jesus. We ask for an outpouring of them, but not for miracles sake, but so that people see Jesus and know that they are loved. And may we now rush to the altar of grace in the wood that is before us and ask, God, would you give us purity? Would you give us power? as we come against the oppressor of the world who hates Jesus, hates his people, that we may remain strong. In Jesus' name, amen.